I'm going to ask you to pray with me. So Jesus, this is your word. It's not my word. Your word is powerful. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, as we learned in Hebrews chapter 4. And so, Lord, all I am is your messenger, and I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would speak, that you would give me clarity of thought and focus, and that nothing would take my attention off of what you've given me to preach today from your word. Help me to be a faithful steward of this message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we've been going through a study of Hebrews. We're at Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, we titled the series Hebrews Then and Now. And the reason why is because we want to talk about what was happening then, but then we also want to compare it to our lives now. And so we came to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. I learned this principle several years ago, and I think it's true. Uh, what I focus on expands. Everybody say it with me. What I focus on expands. So have you ever noticed that uh, you don't really notice, um, how many of you uh, drive a car? Raise your hand. You know how to drive a car, you drive a car. Keep your hands up. I just want to see. All right. If somebody, okay. All, that's all participation. Okay. All right. Let me ask you this question. When you go to buy a new car, all right, so you're thinking about buying a new car, all right, so I was driving a, an Acadia, and I said, I'm going to buy a GMC Sierra, all right? So guess what? I buy the GMC Sierra, and I think that I'm special until I drive off the lot and find out that, oh, there's a GMC Sierra, there's a GMC. How many know what I'm talking about? It, it, starts, it starts messing with your reticular activator. You know what I'm saying? And so what happens is then you're like, it's because you're focused on that new vehicle. And then all of a sudden you see the new vehicles everywhere. It's very interesting because the writer of Hebrews started off writing to these Jews in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And he said this, he said, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Keeping our eyes on who? Jesus. Now, what did I just teach you? Let's say the phrase. What I focus on expands. All right, that was one person with me. Thank you very much, Marie. All right, so everybody ready to go? What I focus on expands. Listen, when I focus on Jesus, the, the author was saying, when you focus on Jesus, you put this, this direct focus on Jesus, then Jesus expands in your life. When I focus on my problems, my problems expand. If you find yourself to be a negative thinker, it's probably because you are focused on negative thoughts. If you find yourself to be a person that is joyful despite your circumstances. Notice I didn't say happy. Happy is happenstance. Happy is I'm happy because of my circumstances, but joy supersedes and goes through the layers of your circumstances. And you find somebody that is joyful in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of hardships. You know why? Because they choose to focus on joy. Not that life is all roses. And the author of Hebrews knew that they were coming out of one religion and they, he was trying to point them toward Jesus and he knew that they would have a very difficult time focusing in on Jesus because Jesus' ways were different than the law that they were brought up under. And he said, run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Most people in the race start off strong. Like I started getting into running and stuff about a year and a half, two years ago. And so now it's like, okay, I've got several marathon, half marathons under my belt. And now the Ironman and now looking forward to doing that. You're like, oh, here he goes again. It fits in with the sermon illustration. Get over yourself. <laughs> Relax. Here's the deal. I, have, I did not see anyone at any marathon doing this at the beginning of the race. Oh my gosh, I can barely make it. 
and crossing the start line. No? 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 You know why? Because they're ready to go at the start. Anyone can start, few finish. I titled the message today, Finishing Well. Because my experience in life, and my experience is limited, only 50 years. Maybe some of you have 65, 70, 75, 80, 84 years of experience. <laughs> Listen, it's a, it's a broader experience, but my experience in life is this. A lot of people start off well in different areas in life. They start off with Jesus with a gunshot. Boom, I'm gonna live for Jesus. Boom, I'm gonna go to church. I'm gonna love Jesus. I'm gonna get into his word. And then after a couple of months or a year and some hardships come on them, it gets difficult to focus on Jesus. Because what I focus on expands and all of a sudden I turn away from Jesus and I start focusing on oh, my life and oh, oh no, oh no, my 401k or no, the government and not the right, oh, what you focus on expands. And the reason why I went to the length of illustrating all that is because he gets to verse 14. And the last part of chapter 12 and then definitely chapter 13 is hard to preach all in one sum, you know, just because I feel like he's starting to go, hey, closing thoughts here. Let me give you this thought about this. Let me give you this thought about this. Let me give you this thought about this. But he does connect some verses here in chapter 12, and I want to read them in their entirety so that you can um, focus on that and understand what we're talking about today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Look at what it says. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. And so the author jumps into two pursuits. He says, there are two dual pursuits that you should have. Like you ought to have a two focused life. As you focus on Jesus, make these your two pursuits. Pursuit number one, pursue peace with everyone. Like if you're really going to focus on Jesus and Jesus is going to be your only focus, he says, pursue peace with everyone. Does that mean that, does that, mean that uh, everyone's going to like me? Hello? No. But Romans chapter 12 Verse 18, I think it is, or 21, one of those says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That my job is to pursue peace. My job isn't to go and stir up problems and trouble and be the problem child. That, that I'm to pursue peace with everyone. I, I want to ask you this question. Don't answer it out loud. Do you pursue peace with everyone, including yourself? Because what I've found is that many people, when they're not at peace with other people, the reason why is because they're not at peace within here. Know this. If somebody gets angry at you on the road for some traffic deal, okay, and it was a mistake, and they take it to another extreme. I've had this happen within myself. Anybody ever had this happen in themselves? All right, some of you are smiling at me, but you don't want to raise your hand. God bless you. I see your hand that you're not raising. <laughs> what happened is somebody did something, and it, maybe it was a mistake, but there was stuff inside of me going on. I wasn't at peace. Because when I'm at peace, and I'm driving along, 
And something like that happens? Okay. Have a good day. Do you pursue peace? Is it part of your pursuit? Look at what it says, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace and what? Holiness. The second pursuit should be holiness. Now, this is a word that we used to hear a lot about, and then now we don't hear a lot about it anymore, and so it gets kind of confusing, like, what is, what is holiness? Holiness is to be set apart, separate from other things, and one and is one of the primary characteristics of God, that God is holy and that God is set apart from everything else in this world. There is nothing that can compare to God. Does that make sense? And so in other words, you can't hold a candlestick, as they would say, to God because God is holy. God is holy as we are to be holy. And holiness does not mean that I have perfection or sinless a life, but it does mean that they and that I and you are fighting sin and living faithfully. In other words, holiness is the expression of life and character, and it's one of the primary expressions of a child of God. In other words, if my life does not reflect that of holiness, that I am set apart from God, that I'm set apart from the world, that I have to ask myself, am I really pursuing Jesus? Here's a question I want you to ask yourself. How different is my life from those that don't know Jesus? I just want this to set for a minute. How different is my life from those that don't know Jesus? Well, I mean, I, I go to church and they don't. Okay. Well, I sometimes read the Bible and I have the Bible app on my phone and sometimes I'll read the verse of the day. All right. Do you see what I'm getting at? If my life doesn't look different from those that don't know Jesus, the question is, do I really know Jesus? And I definitely am not pursuing holiness. The challenge with the church today, I'm just being honest with you, and this doesn't make good preaching today that fills auditoriums. The problem with the church today is the church looks more like the world than it does like God. That's why I don't feel like you hear a lot of preaching on it. Kind of makes you uncomfortable though, doesn't it? To answer this question. How different is my life from those that don't know Jesus? How different is my responses when I get angry? How different is my sexuality? How different is my attitude at work toward my boss? How different is my work ethic? How different is my attitude toward my family members than the family members that don't know Jesus? Do you sit around and gossip like everyone else? Coming up to Thanksgiving, you know. People be talking about Uncle Harry. If you got an Uncle Harry, I'm just making up the name, so I'm sorry, Uncle Fred. (laughs) Uncle Doug, I mean, I could just make up any name, but you know what, if you know what I'm saying, shake your head, at least like, I want to make sure you're alive. What I'm trying to communicate is what the author is trying to communicate, that we should pursue peace with everyone and pursue holiness. The very first sermon that I preached when I was 13 was on 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Look at what it says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. The only way that I'm going to do God's will is to pursue holiness, to pursue that the identity that I am a child of God and that I am set apart and I am his and I am for his service and for his ways, not my ways. So Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 14, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said this, and he had a way of talking. Here's what he said. He said, you will, I don't quote a lot of Charles Spurgeon, all right? Because some of his writings are, are like a little harder to understand, but this is really good. Charles Spurgeon said, you will not gain holiness by standing still. Nobody ever grew holy without consenting, desiring, and agonizing to be holy. He said, sin will grow without sowing, but holiness needs cultivation. Follow it. It will not run after you. You must pursue it with determination, with eagerness, with perseverance, as a hunter pursues his prey. Before we were saved, we chased after sin, and after salvation, sin chases after us. And if we don't pursue holiness. Our relationship with Jesus will be hindered. Hebrews chapter 12, verses one and two says, therefore, since we have such a great large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The author says, listen, you need to lay aside everything that is going to keep you from pursuing peace and holiness. You know what? The people in my life that I've known that have pursued peace and holiness, their lives are not perfect but their lives look much different than the world's. Their responses look different than the world's. You gotta remember, these people were coming from Judaism and they were used to a certain way of doing things. And now the writer of Hebrews is like, hey, there's this guy by the name of Jesus and he's going to turn everything upside down that you ever believed. <laughs> he has a different way of doing things. And look at what he said in verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, make sure that no one, so he says, pursue, pursue what? Pursue what? Pursue peace and pursue what? Holiness. And then he says, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. So, so these Hebrew people, they, they were coming out of a life of legalism. I grew up in a life of legalism. I grew up saying that, that I was told, uh, Jesus will love you and you can love Jesus if you don't listen to this music and if you don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. And I had this long checklist of things. And I tried to never do those because I wanted Jesus to love me and I wanted to love Jesus. And I thought I was good. Until as I grew into adulthood, the people that were around me that were doing those things they just started falling off and denying Christ, turning their backs on Jesus, no longer following him because their way was trying to earn their way to heaven. Like if I do this, this, and this, and this, and this, Jesus is gonna love me. So, so, so the Hebrews knew nothing about grace and all of a sudden, Jesus brings grace in. What, to fall short of the grace of God is to be satisfied with the law rather than grace. So he said, 
be careful that you don't fall short of the grace of God and be more satisfied with the law rather than grace. Because the issue with the law was that they might earn favor with God. And I still think that there are a lot of people in Christianity today that in their minds, they wouldn't verbally say it, but subconsciously they think they're earning favor with God. That God will love me more if I'll do this, this, and this, and this, and this. I don't do this, this, and this, and this, and this to make God love me more or to make God love me at all. I follow Jesus and his ways because he loved me first and because he's my heavenly father and I want to be more like him. And I know that I'm gonna make mistakes. See, Jesus had come to fulfill the law and offered the grace of God as a means of relating with him. So he says, be careful that, that, let's look at verse uh, 14. Let's put verse 15 up there, sorry. I want you to see this. He says, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and defiling many. Isn't it interesting how he brings the peace because bitterness, and it's interesting how, if you look at this, he says the root of bitterness. Why does he say the root of bitterness? Root, can you see the roots of the trees in your yard? Some of them you might be able to, you need to cover those up with dirt, okay? All right, but normally you don't see the roots of the trees. They're down deep. But they're nourishing and sustaining that tree. He said the roots of bitterness. Look at what he said. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God, and I think these are connected, and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and defiling many. I see bitterness seep in and creep into people's lives all the time and, it, and they won't forgive. They won't let things go. And over time, it ultimately destroys them. Why is he bringing grace and bitterness into the same picture? I think it's because of this. Grace is God's undeserved favor, but God gives it to me anyways. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. We sing some songs about that, you know, but he gives it to me anyways. And I think the reason why he connects grace and bitterness is because bitterness many times is toward other people. And if I'm not applying God's grace to my life, it's going to be difficult to apply God's grace to other people. See, see when I apply grace, God's grace to my life and then I go, oh, I need to extend that to this other person. I need to extend that to my wife. I need to extend that to my kids. I need to extend that because God gave me grace. Why do I think it's just for me, but that person needs to burn in hell for what they've done? And I'm telling you, you can Google it. The ramifications and the results of bitterness in a person's life will destroy them. It'll, cry, it'll cause hypertension. It'll cause you know, I believe it will cause diseases. I believe that it will cause things that you don't want to happen in your life. You can take someone that is young and you can make, they can be bitter and they can look like they're an old person. And I've seen it happen. And so he says, apply God's grace to your life. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it, but apply it and take it on. And be careful that bitterness doesn't spring up. and causing trouble and defiling many. See, if you try to make other people pay, it'll never be finished. And as a result, you will never finish well. I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about some of the different things that have helped me in my walk with Jesus. And you know, one of the biggest things, you ready for this? Actually, not just my walk with Jesus, well, my walk with Jesus and in my whole life. It's called the circle responsibility. And I ask myself, is that in my circle responsibility? And if it's not, then guess what? I'm free. I don't have to worry about it. See, I, I know people that take 
uh, other people's stuff on. Have you ever met people like that? Maybe you're one of those kind of people. You take people's stuff on and, and you're trying to, you don't need to do that. It's not your circle of responsibility. Many times we'll be driving down the road. I'll be like, that person is speeding, going way too fast. And my wife has to lean over or kind of pat me on the leg like, you're not the police. I'm like, well, I'm about ready to be because they need to slow down. But you know what though? It's not in my circle responsibility. When I have interactions with people these days, when I was younger, I took everything as my responsibility. You know what the freeing thing is? It's not my circle of responsibility. It's I, I, I will give you counsel. I pray for you. But then you have to make the choices. And if you make choices that wreck your life, it's not in my circle of responsibility. That's freeing and it keeps me from being bitter and frustrated. It sets me free. Bitterness has caused many people to not finish well. Don't let it stop you. Look at verses 16 and 17. And make sure there isn't any immoral, this is gonna get really uncomfortable, all right? So everybody turn to your neighbor and say, this is gonna be uncomfortable. But hang tight, but hang tight, all right? Listen to what it says. This is scripture, okay? And make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. And so the author says, hey, Here's the deal about bitterness. Make sure you're pursuing peace and holiness, but make sure that there is no one among you that is sexually immoral, that is immoral, that is sexually immoral or irreverent. In other words, the author said, don't be like Esau. Trading a single meal for a moment of pleasure. That's the world we live in today. It's a good thing that we're not on Facebook Live right now. You know why? We had to start streaming it ourselves because Facebook Live would shut that stuff down. The Esau came to a moment and he traded his birthright to his brother. And trading his birthright away to Jacob demonstrated his disinterest, not just for his birthright, but for the holy things of God. And then I want you to look at Genesis chapter 25, verse 34. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, and went away. And so Esau, what? Despised his birthright. Here's the big idea. The way to finish well in life's marathon is to pursue peace and holiness. Pursuing the things of Jesus. Pursuing his life and his, his ways. His ways are not my ways. His, his ways are higher than my ways. But pursuing what he has asked me to do has a Christian and has a Jesus follower. See, Esau was like many of us. We can't judge Esau very much because many of us like to take and trade something of value for a moment of pleasure. We trade our holiness and the character of God, Jesus in us, the hope that we have in us, we trade it for a moment. A moment might be a minute, it might be your life, but it's a moment compared to eternity. And the author of Hebrews is clear, pursue peace, pursue holiness. You want to live a life that is focused on Jesus. You want to not be distracted. Focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. 
because it makes me really sad when I see people that start off strong and then they don't finish. Are you pursuing peace and a life of holiness? It's a good question to sit on. How does my life look different than those that don't know Jesus? And I think you got to get beyond, well, I go to church and they don't. Let's get beyond that. Let's get into the character sort of things. Let's bow our heads. I don't know how you're going to apply this message this week. But here's an encouragement. That if you want to finish well with Jesus. That you would spend some time. Asking the Lord. Am I pursuing peace? Am I at peace? Am I always at turmoil? Am I always. My heart's just my stomach. My everything's just always in turmoil. Maybe there's some stuff you need to let go. Maybe, maybe there's some bitterness, roots of bitterness that have crept up in your life. And you need to say, Jesus, I'm going to forgive those people because you forgave me. And then say, Lord, how is my life different from those in the world? If all of my beliefs line up with those that don't know Jesus and the only difference is that we've accepted Christ and they haven't, then the question is, have we truly accepted Christ? Are we truly following Jesus? And I think that was the author of Hebrews' concern, that they would move from Judaism to Christianity, but still be living the ways that they lived before they came to Jesus. What you focus on expands. And Lord, I just ask that as we enter this season of thanksgiving, this season of gratitude, I pray that that would be a season that would would go all throughout our lives. But Lord, most importantly, I pray that you would help us to pursue peace and pursue holiness. Help us to dig into your word and to see what it means to be holy. Help us to make that our prayer that we would be a person of peace and we'd be a person that is living holy, that is set apart unto God as his child. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you for your word. May this week we go and apply it to our lives. Especially the week that we're going to be interacting with family. That they would see Jesus in us. Not self-righteousness, but Jesus. In your name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. amen. I hope you guys have a great day. Love you.